Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest in our series of online programs here at the National Baseball Hall of Fame and Museum. We're very glad that you could be with us today. Uh, it's a very special day throughout Major League Baseball. It is a celebration of Roberto Clemente, this September 9th, 2020. Uh, Roberto Clemente, uh, Hall of Famer, uh, outstanding right fielder. Some have called him the greatest defensive right fielder in the history of the game, perhaps the owner of the strongest throwing arm in baseball history. There's no argument, though, that he was uh, an incredible hero, humanitarian, uh, and somebody that remains very important nearly 50 years after his passing. It's hard to believe that that much time has passed uh, since we lost the great one. And what better person to join us today to talk about Roberto than a man who knew him very well, a man who was friends with him. Luis Mayoral has worked for uh, several major league teams. He has been a Latin American liaison for the Texas Rangers, the Detroit Tigers. He has also served as a broadcaster. In fact, he has done over 2,000 major league games on the radio. He has authored five books and even though he never told me about this before today, I had to read about this on the internet. Mm -hmm. He's actually been a general manager in the Puerto Rican Winter League. Uh, so good. Luis has done just about everything in baseball. He's a great friend of the hall, great friend to me as well, great friend to Clemente. Luis, welcome to the program. It is an honor to have you with us. How are you doing today? I am fine, Bruce, and thanks to God and the magic of communications, I am in sacred baseball land once again. Miss Sarah, my respects to you and to all the baseball fans who may be uh, uh, in attendance today. Could you have seen even 20 years ago doing a program like this? I'm in Cooperstown, you're in Texas, and yet somehow in real time, we're able to see and talk to each other. Could you have seen this at all? Not really, but then <laughs> it's 2020. So, yeah. you know, things really don't surprise me. But it is definitely an honor to be with you again. You, who did a great biography on Roberto Clemente, the great one years ago. And uh, I'm just happy to be with you. I mean, baseball has been my life since I was a child. I'll be 75 in a few months, but I still have that baby living within me. Yeah. Specifically, what day is your birthday, Luis? We'll, uh, we'll make sure to make note of it. December 16th. December 16th, 16th. 1945. That's when I was born. Wow. Terrific. In Ponce, well, in Ponce, Puerto Rico. Yes. Congratulations on that milestone coming up. I want to begin by talking a little bit about this picture that we found. It's, it's a great photograph. There you are on the far left. Uh, to the right of you is the great pirate broadcaster, Bob Prince. Then, of course, in the pirate jacket wearing the 21 is the great one, Roberto Clemente. And to his right, his wife, uh, Vera Clemente, some other folks in the background as well. Uh, we're going to talk about this photograph specifically in a moment. But Luis, let's begin with how you and Roberto first met. What were the circumstances? How did it go? And, and how quickly did you guys become friends? It's a venue that God put out before my life to carry out a mission, to be brief. Since I was a child, I've been in love with the game of baseball. I grew up in Puerto Rico, Panama, and Seattle, Washington. And I was living in Panama in 1956. I could have been like 10 years of age. When, already knowing about the game as a kid, I got so happy in 1956 when Roberto, I believe, hit 311. And to me as a child, uh, a gentleman from, from a small island, uh, hitting 311 in the major leagues, that was, wow, that was huge. And then during vacation in 1959 uh, in Puerto Rico, my uncle took me to a game between San Juan, the team for which Roberto played, and Ponce. And my uncle was good friends with the owner, so I went in after the game, and I met Roberto Jose Santiago of Boston Red Sox saying, that was the first time I was close, close to Roberto. Two years later, 1961, back on vacation in Puerto Rico, Roberto had won the batting championship in the National League. Orlando Cepeda was a big slugger, 42 homers, 146 RBIs. And Luis Arroyo for the Yankees was the best reliever in Major League Baseball. They were offering a clinic, and that's when I really got close, close to Roberto. 
-hmm. There was a, a small shack next to the playing field in Bayamon, and he was tying the laces to his spikes. And me, you know, a kid, went close to him, and what hit me was the cologne that he was wearing. I believe it was canoe. And I said, my God, that impacted me. I said hello. So he said hello, but I was in shock, you know? Yeah. But that was the second time I got close to him. And then, by an act of God, 1965, I had spent some time in Miami. I'm coming back to Puerto Rico, and a gentleman sits next to me. He had a ring, and I knew it was a baseball ring, and I asked him, and he said, that's a 1960 World Series ring for the Pirates. And I asked him, do you know Roberto Clemente? He says, of course I know Roberto Clemente. And he told me something interesting. Besides being a scout, he was the guy who dealt the contracts for Roberto and the Pirates, not Joe Brown. His name was Howie Hake, one of the greatest scouts in the history of the game. And then after Howie went two times a year to Puerto Rico, I got to hook on with Frank Coimbre, a great Puerto Rican ball player who played in the Negro Leagues. And he was a good friend of my grandparents. So, you know, everything was paid for me, as I said. And then with Howie and Frank, around 1964 or 65, I visited Roberto for the first time in his home in the outskirts of San Juan, and in a big balcony where, where you can see from literally Europe to, to New York, I'm exaggerating, you can see all San Juan. He and I stood at a corner of the balcony. I, I was just a kid, and uh, we just started talking baseball a little bit, but then he went into talking about how much he cared for people, how much he worried about the people who were in need, uh, a little bit about politics. So our friendship necessarily didn't have baseball as a common denominator. It was about life, about people, about his feelings towards humanity. Then- So it was Frank and Howie that invited you over to the house? Yes, yes. Howie was staying at uh, Hilton in, in uh, San Juan. Frank was a scout for the Pirates. And since I had the relationship with Frank, Frank told me, let's go see Howie. And one day in particular, Howie said, hey, let's go see Roberto. Yeah. So we took a cab. Uh, it wasn't in style to rent a car then. We took a cab to Roberto's place. And that's how I first came uh, as an adult, let's say, yeah. uh, face to face to Roberto. How nervous were you when you went into his house and started talking with him? I was nervous because I knew what he stood for. And I was a baseball freak. So I know of his beats up to that time. What surprised me is that he was wearing gray shorts, uh, barefooted, no shirt, because he had been mowing the lawn in the rear of his house, which was in a slope. So he came up, and during our visit, that's what he wore, shorts, barefooted, no shirt. That was Roberto, really, really down to earth, really down to earth. Now, he's always been known for being, at least to the public, a very serious individual, serious about baseball, serious about social causes off the field and away from the ballpark. But you've always told me that when you got Roberto in a, in a certain setting with family and friends, a very different kind of personality came through. That's true. Roberto and Vera, his uh, wife who passed away last November, told me in New Jersey at Stockton State a few years ago, what I told her, he was a clown. She says, yes, he loved the people that he cared for, and he was a clown as to them. Now, let me give you a few examples I have here in a little note. Uh, one time, uh, late 90s, early, early, seven, late 60s, early 70s, he picked me up at the airport. And uh, he had a new car. So we were driving around San Juan, and there was a highway, uh, Carpenter Road in Rio Piedras. And he started going like fast, weaving in and out. And I said, hey, que pasa? Tu sabes what's happening, man? And then he looked at me because he had, he had a deceptive smile. You don't know if he was kidding. You don't know if he was saying the truth. And Manny Sanguillan, if you were to ask him, has the same idea as to that deceptive smile. And he said, don't worry, Luisito. Luis diminutive. Don't worry, Luisito. I'm a better rider, driver than Fangio. Banjo was an Argentinian well known for, for uh, racing cars. And he just smiled at me and he kept on weaving in and out. And I prayed all the way until we got to his home. That's Roberto, number two. Was uh, he the kind of guy, would he, would he rib you a little bit? Would he poke fun at you in a good way? 
Oh, yes, yes, yes. He was very jovial with me. Our relationship was very jovial. And I do want to make clear, uh, uh, Bruce, that our friendship didn't last 25 years, 18 years. Our friendship, which was tight by, by nature, was based on, on simply talking about people, the world, politics, like I said before. Uh, again, baseball was not the common denominator in our friendship. But yes, here's another one that he pulled for me. Spring training, 72, uh, Bradenton, Florida. After a workout, I stayed in his room that weekend. He said, no, no, you stay with me in my room. Uh, afternoon, maybe around four, he said, I'm gonna make you the punch that keeps me healthy and strong. I said, well, fine, let's try it. So he takes a beater, he pumps in there literally eight, 10 eggs, and a little bit of ice, and Welch, great juice. And he beat it for like five or 10 minutes. He gives me a glass with that dedication that he prepared it. You know, it touched my heart. He gave me a glass, try it. And to be very sincere, I didn't like it at all. I didn't like the taste, but you know, out of respect, I said, man, that's the best punch I tried in my life. And he took that in like, wow, I can make a good punch, you know? But the thing is that he was very open to the people that he, that he cared for. And I remember that while making the punch, he had shoes on and he had red shorts, boxing shorts, like boxing shorts. And he walked around the, the room, the apartment there at Pirate City. And uh, we just had a great time. You know, Roberto was a joker, And he used to kid a lot with Manny Sanguillan too. And, and talking about favorite people in his life quickly, before I forget, the mentors for him besides mom and dad, Luis and uh, Luisa and Melchor, uh, Martino, who visited the Hall of Fame uh, a few years back with Roberto Alomar. Martino's 92. He yeah. lives in Carolina, Puerto Rico. Roberto adored him. Roberto loved Pancho Coimbre, the scout that I spoke to before in relationship to, to how we hate. And, and, and the guy he loved the most in the game is Manny Sanguillan. They were like brothers. However, there was an individual in Pittsburgh who was key to Roberto, to helping him transition from the Latino culture into mainstream America. He was a postman by the name of Phil Dorsey. Those were the four people that I got from him that he really cared for. I mean, he loved humanity, but those were special. Martino, his brother, Frank Coimbre, Manny Sanguillan, and Phil Dorsey. Fascinating stuff. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this photo, Luis. Uh, tell us the date. Uh, there's a, uh, an award that you're mm -hmm. presenting to Roberto. Uh, mm -hmm. We see his wife, Vera, on the far right. We see the great broadcaster, Bob Prince. Tell us when this happened and what exactly is going on. Sunday, October 1st, 1972. The day after the 3,000 hit. What I have there is a trophy with a clod of earth mm. from Puerto Rico. And I brought it as a symbol of like, wow, you came from this little place, this little island, you made it big, 3,000 hits. So he took it well. I mean, he was really touched by it. Uh, Bob Prince and I conducted a pregame ceremony before presenting it to him. And the lady next to me, is Dora Matos de Pasarel. She is the mother of Charlie Pasarel, a Puerto Rican who was an outstanding member of the U.S. Davis Cup team in the 60s, who's lived in California ever since, and obviously Vera. Now, I'll tell you the guy, the clown who lived in Roberto. I won't give you all the specifics. I'll leave it up in the air. When I am telling him this is from the people of Puerto Rico, this is part of our island, uh, he had a joke about a cow, but I'll leave it there. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> that was Roberto. You asked me about Roberto the Clown, and Vera is laughing big time yeah. as soon as she heard those words. And she told me in Stockton, the people he loved, he would kid with them, but he mentioned something about the cow. God bless the cow. <laughs> Vera seems to be enjoying this more than anybody in this particular uh, photograph here. Was this the last time that you saw Roberto, given that this no. was October of 72? No. I saw Roberto the last time, and I want to thank uh, a great historian in Puerto Rico, Jorge Colón Delgado, a good friend, too, of the Hall of Fame. 
He's the guy who pinpointed the last day I saw Roberto. And it was the 27th of December, mm. a few days after the earthquakes in Nicaragua. Yeah. I went there and I had gathered a few clothes I didn't need. I, I bought some, uh, some food and so forth, you know, and took it out there. When I got to the stadium, the corridor of High Beethorn Stadium, that's the main stadium in San Juan. Yeah. He was accommodating goods sweaty and everything and he had good clothes on he was all dressed in brown brown boots brown pants brown guayabera with white designs so he's bending down and i go by and give him a tap on the butt like the coaches do when the guy who's hit a homer rounds third base to go to home plate he jumped up he saw me and he cracked up that was the last time i saw him i was there maybe 20 minutes or so whatever with him and he tells me right there and then Luisito. Call me around the 30th or the 31st so you can come home with your family and share time with us. Uh, that 31st, I called starting maybe 10, 11 in the morning. I didn't get an answer, so I just decided to go home to see my parents. While with my parents, uh, someone tells me uh, the plane went down. I said, what plane went down? Uh, Clementa's plane. But this is the thing. I didn't believe it because he had told me that he was going to Nicaragua, that he'd be back in a couple of days in due time for the get together at his home. But then a gentleman at a drugstore close to home told me, uh, hey, it's true, he died. A block from there, I, I went to the shop, but a block from there, there were pirates playing winter ball. Manny Sanguinian, Rennie Stennett, a pitcher, last name Johnson and so forth. And from that moment on, for about a month and a half, uh, my life was not normal at all. I couldn't sleep. I had been uh, submitting scouting reports for the Pirates, uh, but that took me off pace completely for a month. And uh, that helped me, in fact, uh, swallow, literally, the blow of his death. And I want to bring to you something interesting. It's uh, maybe 10, 12 days after the accident, Manny Sanguijan, Jackie Hernandez, who I know you well remember, myself and Fernando Gonzalez, who was a utility infielder for the Pirates, went to the Coast Guard base uh, in, in Old San Juan. And the commander in there, whose name I don't recall, told us that what could have happened to the remains of Roberto, it's sad, but it, it's true. Uh, upon impact of the plane, uh, they could have crushed and disintegrated. Uh, underwater currents could have taken him out and taken them out to the Atlantic Ocean. More crude than anything else, uh, sharks could have done their job with their remains. The only remain that was uh, found was that of uh, pirate Jelly, Jerry Hill, yeah. who had the steering wheel of the plane uh, crush his stomach. And that was the only remains of a person that they found was Jerry Hill, but Roberto, God bless his soul, was, was never found. There's a famous story of Manny Sanguian actually going scuba diving uh, off the shore, trying to find remains of Roberto or the other survivors or pieces of the plane. I heard that it was actually shark infested waters that he yes, was diving true. into, but he was willing to risk himself uh, just to have this little bit of closure with Clemente. There, there, there was a genuine brotherhood right there. And uh, the thing is, that was on the, on the 2nd of, uh, of January, 1973, because the previous night, uh, the 1st of January, Manny and I and a few people went to Old San Juan, where there is a national cemetery because someone said, and in desperation, you know, you do whatever, someone said that they had heard someone yelling from some rocks off the shore, and they thought maybe that was Clemente. But when things like that hit you, even though you have faith in God, well, you do whatever out of desperation. So that morning of the, of the second of, yeah, of the first of December, of January, we, we walked out there for like two or three hours, almost until four in the morning. They were sad days, you know, but uh, it's things that you, you can't forget. You can't forget. No question the difficulty of those days. Let's go back to some happier times. We found mm -hmm. some 
wonderful photographs of Roberto and Vera. The photograph on the left is from their wedding day, uh, which was 1964. Uh, looks like Roberto is in a traditional tuxedo. Vera, of course, a beautiful uh, wedding gown. And then a little bit later photograph, I want to say, maybe taken in the early 70s, maybe late 60s. Uh, we see Vera once again laughing, smiling. She always seems to be like that in these photographs. Uh, Roberto with a little bit more of a serious look. Uh, he's kind of looking off to the side a bit. Uh, but just wonderful to see these uh, photographs. Um, you know, sadly, they were only married for, well, the eight years because of right. the tragedy. Right. Uh, but um, those eight years, pretty special. Uh, Roberto and Vera met in Carolina, Puerto Rico. Uh, I can't specify the date right now, but Roberto went into a drugstore once and, and saw her there, and he went, wow. <laughs> So um, he made uh, his inquiries as to who she was. And Mrs. Clemente told me once years ago that uh, he had gone to the house in a Comandante urbanization and told her, I just saw the lady I'm going to marry. So it was kind of like love at first sight. And before I go to the second picture, I do want to say something that it's a coincidence and it's lost in history, but to me and to many on the island. When Roberto married Vera, she was the most beautiful young lady in Puerto Rico. And there was another slugger, another great player from Puerto Rico, Orlando Cepeda. When he married Annie Pino years before, she was also the most beautiful lady on that island. So the two big uh, honchos in baseball married two beautiful ladies who were great ladies. And the other one, if I'm not mistaken, Bruce, was taken prior to or after a Mama Leone's uh, restaurant in New York, mm. where Roberto was honored for having been the MVP in the 1971 World Series. Oh. Those are great pictures. Those are great yeah. pictures, no doubt. Interesting that you could pinpoint uh, to, to almost an exact date there. You mentioned earlier that we did lose uh, Vera last year. It was about a year ago was the fall of 2019. She'd been ill for a while. She passed away at the age of 78. I obviously was not around to have met Roberto, but I did have the pleasure of meeting Vera for the first time back in 2000 when she came here with their middle son, uh, Luis. Uh, right. We had dinner with them at, at the Oda Saga, which was a tremendous thrill. She could not have been more gracious, more charming, uh, just a wonderful person. She was to me an angel. Uh, Vera and Roberto, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, Bruce, are human beings that I have qualified for many years now as persons who did not allow society to contaminate them. Mm -hmm. They were clean-cut human beings, believers in God, and they were examples for everyone. One of my happiest days you know, my association with the Clemente family was maybe, what, 10 years ago or so when the commissioner's office honored her for being an ambassador at an international level for MLB. Mm. Vera gave everything MLB needed since the day after his death. And to me, that really touched me. I happened to be in New Jersey at a ceremony when that happened, and uh, she was so thrilled. Very humble. She never made waves. Very humble, but she was proud that she was an ambassador for Major League Baseball. To this day, if she were alive, she would tell you, like she told me many times, whoa, man. She'd tell me, Luisito, at times I'm here at home, and I believe that one day, maybe at 3 or 4 in the morning, there will be a knock on the door. And I will hear him say Verin. He used to call her Verin, a diminutive for Vera. Verin, I am finally home. She mm. told me that. And every time she told me that, like when I tell you right now, it brings tears to my eyes. She was a special, special, special human being. And I know now that they rest peacefully, eternally uh, with God in heaven. Yes, sir. In so many of these photos, we do see Vera smiling, laughing, mm -hmm. having a good time. 
but you obviously knew them both well. Did you ever see a time where she was a little bit irritated with him or annoyed by something he said or did? Not really. No. Not really. I never saw that. I saw communication. I saw joy. Uh, they had a perfect setup in their lives, you know? Uh, she always used to tell me, for example, going off that thing specifically, that Roberto was not a good sleeper. And the only time he slept well was when the room was back black that's when roberto used to sleep well and they had a beautiful thing going on for them it's like uh, a masterpiece by by the great architect you know that yeah. was their they were a great example as a couple great example i take it she had a very good sense of humor as well yes very yes yeah. she was kind of like quiet she had a peculiar way of laughing i mean i can't convey it to you but she was simply Let's say the vibes that came from her presence had a touch of, of angels. That was Vera to me. That was Vera to me. Here's I another mean. wonderful photograph. This is the entire family. And this had to have been around 1970, 71. We see Roberto in the middle, right. obviously Vera on the right. And then the three boys, all in identical suits, blue yes. suits with shorts. Uh, we have uh, Roberto Jr., we have Luis, we have Enrique. Mm -hmm. What comes to mind when you see this photograph? Family unity. To the side, half hidden is his mom. Uh, they live for the kids. They live for the kids. Uh, Roberto told me many times that he wanted their kids to be successful. He wanted them to be educated. But at the same time, he wanted them to suffer because the people who suffered, like the strugglers and yeah. the taxi drivers with him, he identified the factory workers are the people who know the true essence of what being alive is. And that mentality he projected towards the future of his sons. I want them to have everything, but I want them to suffer maybe as an education and learning to appreciate what life is all about. Roberto was a great thinker, great yeah. thinker. When you, when you say suffer, I, I don't want people to misinterpret that, um, but he didn't want them to be spoiled. He didn't want them to have everything. He wanted them to work hard. He wanted them to go through the normal travails of life, learn from those situations, and obviously be better prepared for adults. That's what he really wanted. That is true. You said it in a perfect way. There's no way to better what you just stated. You're right. Now, Roberto Jr., uh, whom I've met, um, was a player, played in the minor leagues, but had some injury problems, right. um, has gone on to be very successful, has done uh, broadcasting. Uh, Luis, I've come to know very well. Uh, we're Facebook friends, and he comes to Cooperstown Yes. Well, pretty much every year for induction if, if he's able to, to travel. Uh, I have not met Enrique. Um, Enrique, I was told in the past, did not really like to leave Puerto Rico. He rather understandably uh, had or has a fear of flying, didn't like to come to the United States um, uh, because of that. Uh, but tell us a little bit about Enrique, because uh, he's the one I've never met and I, I know the least about him. Enrique is a gentleman. Enrique, I believe, is more introvert, more shy than anything else. And uh, that's just the way the Lord met him, made yeah. him. He's proud of his dad, no doubt, as are Roberto and Luis. But Ricky was cut from a model, another model. You know what I mean? He's yeah. more a stay-at-home guy, uh, very nice, very quiet. That's just the way the Lord made him. Now, of the three, of the three, I haven't seen uh, Enrique in some years, but physically, he had more resemblance to Roberto than, than Luis and, and, uh, and Roberto Jr. Oh, really? But, um, you know, they, it's a great family, great family. They stuck together. They uh, were with their mom until the last day, and uh, they grew up well. They grew up well, but at the same time, humble, down to earth. Now, oh, in the photo, that must be Enrique, whom Roberto is holding, right? That is correct. Enrique, and, and the then Roberto, Roberto Jr. and then Luis, right? Yeah. That's them right there. 
that that could have been that could have been uh, in Pittsburgh uh, when they held his day, I believe in 1970, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, um, could have been New York Shea Stadium. They had a day for him also once, but that is a great great family picture, no doubt, no doubt, no doubt. Obviously, Roberto and, and Vera love the kids, their own children, but Roberto had a general love of kids. One of the things that he did regularly was go home to Puerto Rico after the season, and he would hold these clinics for yes. kids, for underprivileged kids. You talked about going to one of these clinics yourself. Right. And this photo really you know, illustrates what he felt about you know, that next generation coming up. This was a guy that just, he loved being around the kids, trying to help them in any way that he could. Mm. It's just a great photo. And that photo there was taken in Pittsburgh around December, no, January of 1972. You know, a year practically before he died. Yeah. He and I had been working that off season like 10 Fridays in a row where he conveyed to me how he envisioned accomplishing his dream, the sports city. And I worked with him. I even have manuscripts at home, here at home, of him and what he jotted down from where I then made a report or an analysis of the whole thing. And he asked me when I presented him January 31st, 1972, his 11th gold glove. Uh, Rawlings had me, gave me that honor. He told me, meet me tomorrow morning at home which would have been the 30th of January, just before he took off for New York to receive an award. Uh, what was it? Yeah, for the 71 World Series too, I believe. Oh. And he asked me to help him get a corporation to back him up. He says, I don't want money. I want the sports city to get going. I don't want money. I don't want to make a living out of the sports city. I want to utilize the sports city as a way to unite the Puerto Rican families together. If by any chance we get any world-class athletes, well, you know, that's a gift. Mm. And he told me, could you get a corporations for me to throw me out to the world? And uh, I had links with Eastern Airlines and Roberto became a spokesperson for Eastern. He signed a two or three year contract and he became the first MLB ball player, I believe from Latin America to get a sponsorship of that nature, even though it wasn't for money. He just wanted them to put out to the world uh, the idea of the Clemente Sports City. And he joined Chichi Rodriguez, one of his best friends. They played amateur ball together. And uh, Billie Jean King, mm -hmm. the great tennis player. They were spokespeople for, for Eastern Airlines. And that photo was taken in Pittsburgh that summer because uh, a group of little leaguers came to Puerto Rico to do a commercial for Eastern at uh, Three River Stadium. Mm. I remember that well. I have heard stories, Luis, that during mm. the season, Clemente would very quietly on off days or maybe in the afternoon with a night game coming up that evening, he would sneak off to the local hospital, the Pittsburgh Children's Hospital. And he would do this without media, without any coverage. He didn't let reporters know. And he would just very quietly go and visit with kids who were ill. And I'm sure in some cases, uh, children that had diseases from which they were not going to recover, right. terminal diseases. But this was something that he did on a regular basis. And he did it very quietly with no publicity. Have you heard yeah. that as well? Oh, very correct. You are very correct. He loved kids. He was genuine about kids. But then going back to Pittsburgh now, there was a case that not too many people know of. Back in the late 50s, maybe early 60s, a soldier from Pittsburgh was stationed in Henry Barracks. That was an army installation right smack in the middle of Puerto Rico, the town of Calle, Henry Coulomb. And while Henry served there, he met a young lady from Carolina, Roberto's hometown, Elsa. Mm. They got married. And since Henry was a Pittsburgher, when he got out of the army, they came up to live in Pittsburgh. I met Henry late 60s, early 70s, very down to earth, man, very down to earth. He tells me, this is a story I don't tell many people, but look what Roberto did for me. Things were bad for them financially. He had been out of a job and so forth. 
and kind of like uh, they didn't let Roberto know, but I guess he figured it out. So the guy, they're suffering. So one day, out of the blue, he says, in an off day, Roberto took off and went to see, I believe, Mayor Barr, B-A-R-R, in Pittsburgh, if my memory does not fail me. He spoke to Mayor Barr about the Coulons, Henry and Elsa, and Mayor Barr got him a lifetime job as a conductor of one of the barges that were in charge of the maintenance of the three rivers in Pittsburgh. He didn't tell anyone. Yes, when he got the job, he found out that Roberto did that no one knew, and that applies to what you just stated as to his love and, and care for people. That was Roberto, he was genuine. Amazing, just incredible. Mm -hmm. You know, it's well known that Jackie Robinson, whom we recently honored, he had his own day with Major League Baseball not long ago. He had a very strong friendship with Dr. Martin Luther King, the leader yes. of the American Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. Uh, here's a very famous photograph. We have a copy of this photograph that is hanging on one of the walls in our mm -hmm. Giamatti Research Center. I believe it's up on the second floor. So they had a very famous relationship. Robinson was an advisor to Martin Luther King, uh, gave him advice, uh, offered his wisdom on what might be the proper ways to approach the fight for civil rights. What is not as well known, and I couldn't find any photographs of Dr. Martin Luther King mm -hmm. with Roberto Clemente, but they had a friendship, a relationship. Tell us about that. Yes, that's interesting, and I'm very glad you bring that up, and I'll tell you why later. Martin Luther King officially visited Puerto Rico two times. In 1972, he gave a speech at the Inter-American University in San Germán, in the West Coast. He was a guest of Professor Brank Fulton. Another official visit, 1965. World Convention of the Churches of Christ. Martin Luther King went there too. On and off, it's been said that he may have visited Puerto Rico incognito, whatever, a few more times. And here is what I have gathered, uh, and I'll tell you why I bring this up. Uh, in the spring of 1972, Roberto told me in Bradenton that he had gotten together with Martin Luther King, 64 ish, 65, at a small farm, which would be the home of a restaurant on El Carretero that Roberto owned. Okay. Uh, I did further research. Uh, in Pittsburgh, there were some uh, Freedom Jubilees held in 60 and 61. And Martin Luther King made presence there also. So, you know, it's difficult when I'm not a specialist historian in research because I don't have the resources. But the fact that there was a writer 51 years with the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, Al Abrams. Mm -hmm. Al Abrams stated, and it's quoted by, I believe a historian by the name of uh, Steele, David Steele, that on July 9th, 1961, uh, Abrams is sitting down with Martin Luther King. And Martin Luther King told Abrams that he had followed Roberto since his first years in Major League Baseball, and that since then he understood that Roberto will be one of the great stars of the future. Uh, who Mr. David Steele is, I don't know. But that came to my knowledge on December 13th, 2018. Hmm. So Steele writes that Abrams and Martin Luther King meet, and Martin Luther King told Abrams that he had met Roberto in 1962. Now, I have no factual, no, 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 no physical proof of that, but that's what I go by. You know, I'm, I don't think Roberto would have lied to me about his relation with Martin Luther King. And then you further investigate like I do have that bug in me like you do too for example October 8th 1972 a Sunday in Pittsburgh the TV station WIIC TV a good friend 
Sam Nover, I don't know if he's alive, but he's a good man, uh, interviewed Roberto in what was to be his last interview in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And thanks to another great friend of the Hall of Fame, a professor and writer, he collaborates with your publications, Daniel Torres in New York. Yep. Uh, Nover asked uh, Martin Luther King about Martin Luther King to Roberto, and he says, Roberto, you knew him well. You knew him quite well. Talk to me a bit about Martin Luther King. And after seeing the, the CD that I got from Danny, he said, and I'll read it right here, he changed the lifestyle of the American black. He changed the lifestyle of everybody. And you are a student of the game. You know that Martin Luther King was assassinated April 4th, 1968 at about 20 of the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. Roberto, due to the link, the friendship like you well stated, and I do, he had Martin Luther King. It shook him, it shook him. And he led a movement surprisingly with an Anglo pitcher, David Wickersham, to asked uh, the Pirates, um, possibly Houston, not to play opening day, April 8th. Yeah. As you know, April 9th was the burial of Martin Luther King. So opening day was set back until April 10th. But Roberto took the, the lead in asking for due respect for Jackie Robinson as a ball player, a man, and his legacy. But then also, it so happens, there were three other outstanding players who joined ranks with Roberto and Wickersham. Bob Gibson, Lou Brock, and Orlando Cepeda of the St. Louis Cardinals. They joined in, and that way, Roberto and Cepeda and Brock and Wickersham and Kurt Flood they put baseball then in its proper perspective as to recognizing a man who had done so much for humanity and at the same time in a very subtle and respectful way bring out to the world that we are all sons of gods and citizens precisely of, of the world. That's my whole recollection yeah. as to Roberto Clemente and Jackie Robinson. I think in addition to Clemente and Wickersham on the Pirates, I think Don Clendenin was also oh, Yes, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right, yeah. you're right, you're right. Because Don right. had gone to, uh, to right. um, uh, was it Moorhead University, mm -hmm. uh, which was an all-black college, and Martin Luther sure. King, I believe, was his advisor, his mentor. Okay. So he, he became very close to the family, and I think he, along with Clemente and Wickersham, pretty much insisted that we're not going to play. We're right. going to cancel opening day. We're going to delay it for at least a day or two, and that's what ended up happening. And I'm, I'm glad you bring it up. You know, at times I rely too much on my memory, and there are mistakes or, or things that you forget. But, yes, you're correct. I had heard about that before, Don Clendon. Yes, sir. Well, yes. you had all the other names, so don't uh, right, right, break yourself right. too much. Um, let's talk about another issue related to the issue of race. It's the all-black lineup. It's something that I've written about. A few other writers have written about. It hasn't received a tremendous amount of attention, but it was September 1st, 1971. Right. that The Pirates started what is believed to be not only the first, but the only all-black lineup in Major League history. Did you ever talk to Roberto about this event specifically or maybe about the fact that the Pirates had so many Black and Latino players at the time? Did those topics ever come up between you and Roberto? Yeah, I, I, I don't recall talking to him about September 1st, even though we knew the importance. You know, I remember Manny Sanguin and Renny Stennett was there too. Gene Kleins may have, been, may have well been there too. You know, yeah, he was in the lineup uh, that day. Right, yeah. now. The thing with that is one of the things I love the Pirates. As I said, I worked for them for a decade as a scouting winter baseball league, not seeking for talent with the Puerto Rican Winter League. 
And the gentleman behind that was Joel Brown. Joel Brown was a different kind of man. He was a positive cat of a different breed, very gentle, very professional. And he had a liking to Latinos in general. He knew how to give value to the talent first, and then he didn't care where the players came from. And that's one of the reasons why I identified with, with, with Joel Brown. Yeah. Uh, he died in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and he called me maybe a week or so, maybe two weeks before he passed, you know? And I was always in love with the spirit of, jo of, of Joel Brown. So, you know, he was an architect of that team. Yeah. He knew the talent he had. And Danny Murta is another guy I loved. Danny was kind of like rough, you know? but a good, good person. So I don't know if it happened uh, coincidentally or if they did it on purpose, but for whatever reason, that's a day to be remembered in the history of baseball because MLB has an ingredient, like I say, to bridge among citizens, to bridge among cultures. And when things like that happen, Major League Baseball's image goes way, way high. And that's one of the beauties of the game of baseball. I think the best part of the story is that basically the same team, although they never again put the all-black lineup on right. the field, but basically the same team, which had anywhere from 11 to 13 African-American and Latino players, that same team six weeks later goes on to win the world championship. That's how and it you is. Can't, you can't have a better advertisement for integration than that. And let me tell you something, coming back now to modern times, 1992, when I started working for the Texas Rangers, uh, they had perhaps 12, 13 players on the active roster. And I guess that, you know, it's difficult for, for people from the States who have not been exposed to other cultures to deal with, you know? So that's why uh, guys like, like George W. Bush, uh, John Blake, uh, 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 Tom Green, they brought me on board to be a liaison, to get their Spanish broadcasting off the, on the air and so forth. And that's one of the beauties of the game. George W., my friend, I'm not into politics, but he's my friend I love and respect. He always told me, I don't care where they're from. As long as they play well, they're welcome on my team. And those are the things that, that baseball does. I mean, the arts, education, and sports bring the people together. We're going to take some questions for Luis Mayoral as we continue our conversation. We've had a number of people already chime in um, in the uh, in the chat room, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, let me make one correction here. This is pointed out to me by Joanne Kleins. Um, I think I'd said that she was a daughter-in-law of Jean Kleins. No, she is the wife of Jean Kleins. I'm sorry, I somehow mixed that up. So I apologize to uh, Joanne for that, but we're very glad that Joanne could, uh, could join us um, and be part of the program. Gene Kleins was part of the all black lineup. He yes. was one of the five African-American players who started that day, yes. uh, including the Hall of Famer Willie Stargell, uh, who was in the lineup along with Clemente, mm -hmm. Sanguian, uh, Rennie Stennett, Al Oliver, Dave Cash, Jackie Hernandez, and uh, maybe one or two others. Doc Ellis was the starter right, uh, right. on that day. Um, one of the things um, one fan said, uh, please mention the Clemente Museum in Pittsburgh, which I have never been to, but I've heard is wonderful. Have you been there, Luis? I, I've been there a few times. I am happy to, to be a friend of the reader, the, the president. And that is something comparable, even though smaller, to the mansion that the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown offers the world. They've yeah. done a great job. Uh, I believe in them. And uh, anytime I'm around, I'm around the Pittsburgh area, I, I usually visit it. it, it it's uh, an old uh, a fire station that's been redone. And let me tell you, it's of great quality. And uh, uh, what I would like is for people to contribute more to it at times, you know, more with this time you're living as to what's happening to the world. 
but it does deserve the backing of, of, of all fans. And it's a, it's a great landmark. It's a great landmark, no doubt. And I'm proud that Roberto has that because back home in Puerto Rico, I'll be very sincere, you know, people tend to forget the greatness of a, a man who, who has been a, God, a, a gift of God to humanity by way of baseball, Roberto Clemente. The Clemente Museum, I believe, is open for tours by appointment. So if you contact them ahead of time, they can probably set you up and, yes, sir. Uh, and yes, take sir. you around. We yes, have a question sir. coming in from uh, Steve. While on vacation in Puerto Rico, we visited Hidambi Thorn Stadium. Steve wants to know, did Roberto ever play there? Yes, Roberto played in Hiram B. Thorne Stadium. He managed in Hiram B. Thorne Stadium also. That is correct. Yes. Yeah. You know, you Hiram mentioned Thorne, Clemente. It was, uh, Hiram B. Thorne was the first Puerto Rican player ever to play in MLB. Pitcher yeah. for the Cubs. You mentioned that Clemente managed. If he had lived, do you think he might have been a manager at the big league level? Do you think that might have occurred? Uh, you know, we spoke about that, but he never brought up managing. He did manage in Puerto Rico, and he did manage uh, doing a favor, I believe, to Mario Mayito Nevarez, the owner of San Juan. And Roberto told him, I'll manage, but this uh, management position goes to Nino Escalera. He played for the Cincinnati Reds in the 50s. And, uh, but he never mentioned to me that he wanted to be a manager. He did say that when he retired, he would love to stay affiliated to the game in any capacity, which I believe would, he would enjoy being an instructor in spring training, working PR for, for, for the Pirates. And with the mind that Bowie K. Kuhn had, Roberto could have been an assistant to the commissioner as later on was Monty Irving. Yeah. So he would have stayed, he would have stayed within the game, but I don't think he really wanted to manage. No, no way. Yeah. Had he wanted to, you know, he would have told me I want to manage, but I don't think he was uh, uh, anxious to do that. Not at all. Not yeah. at all. When he did manage in the Puerto Rican Winter League, he was old school. He was a disciplinarian. Uh, he and Mike Cuellar butted heads because Cuellar kind of had his own schedule and his own way of doing things. And Clemente made it very clear, no, you're going to follow my rules. You're going <laughs> to do things the way I want to do. Well, they didn't get along very well. So Roberto had the, he had the old school Danny Murtaugh approach in some way. Right. Let, let me tell you Mike Cuellar. Mike Cuellar, I love to. He's since gone. But he was a happy-go-lucky. There yeah. was not an ounce of ill in him. He was just one of those guys who lived and was happy. Uh, but Roberto, one of the th things be why he succeeded is he took everything so seriously, you know? He gave himself to, to the game. I remember, for example, in Pittsburgh particularly, the many times I visited, uh, he picked me up at the Hilton. And, you know, Three Rivers was across the, the, the river right there. And from the hotel to three years, there was a, like a facial transition in him. Like I, I saw that he was happy I was there, but his mind was elsewhere, like getting ready to go to war. I noticed that. And uh, the time I saw him accommodating the goods for relief to Nicaragua, I saw in him that same, that same face, the warrior. Like he was in uniform, ready to go out on the field. That was how much dedicated he was to helping the people in Nicaragua as much as when he took the field wearing the Pirates uniform. Yes, that, that was Roberto. Let's say Clemente, if he had lived, decided not to pursue a baseball career. Do you think he might have gone into political work, become a councilman, maybe run for mayor? Do you think that doing social political work might have been his approach post-baseball? Well, he came packaged with trying to help people in any way possible. He was pro-Commonwealth, which is the status of Puerto Rico. In nice words, it's a colony. But he understood that then that was what was more beneficial to Puerto Rico because that popular Democratic Party fed they gave clothes, they gave medical attention to millions of Puerto Ricans 
who really had no resources whatsoever. The educational level way back then was not necessarily the best in the world. So when he saw that Luis Munoz Marin, one of the people he admired the most, a great statesman, and I know you know history, you know who I'm talking about, who was the first governor of Lilek. When he saw that Munoz Marin sacrificed his idealism as to Puerto Rico being independent and wanted to stay linked to the U.S. of A., he, like Chichi Rodriguez, I spoke to them both about it, they said, I am voting for the Commonwealth status because they're helping my people. And that was Roberto Stoy's politically speaking. But I think he had the intellect. Many people don't remember, Bruce, that prior to signing with, with, uh, with uh, uh, the Dodgers, he was headed to the University of Puerto Rico to be engineering in Maya West. Roberto was a smart person, very smart person. But he loved the game and, you know, uh, the plan of life had it for him to become who, who he has become. We have just a couple of minutes remaining with uh, Luis Mayoral. Uh, just a couple of the artifacts that we have featured here at the Hall of Fame. We have a we have a number of items related to Clemente's career. These, I think, are two of the more interesting ones. On the right is a copy of the first pro contract that he signed. That was with the Santorce franchise, right? The Puerto Rican Winter League. Uh, that copy of that contract is on display in our Viva Baseball exhibit on the second floor. We also have this cap, which I believe is in storage right now. We do use it for VIP artifact spotlights here at the mm -hmm. Hall of Fame. It's a cap from 1972. We believe he was wearing it the day that he picked up his 3,000th, and it turned out to be his final regular season hit in Major League history. Uh, so the cap, the contract, just two of the items that we have featured here in Cooperstown. Um, I'm going to try to squeeze in just one more question because I know some other people have popped into the uh, chat room here. So let me just forward a little bit. Um, Joanne Kleins actually points this out. If I'm not mistaken, the guys did not realize the lineup was all black until after the fact. This is September 1st, 71. I'm so impressed that the five players stood in solidarity not to play on April 8th, referring to the aftermath of Martin Luther mm -hmm. King's assassination. Uh, that took a lot of, uh, a lot of courage. Right. Um, so that's from uh, Gene's wife, uh, Joanne Kleins, talking about uh, that all black lineup. And it's interesting, there wasn't a lot of media coverage because there was a Pittsburgh newspaper strike at the time. I think somebody, according to Bill Guilfoyle, former Hall of Fame uh, executive and former PR director for the Pirates, uh, he said that somebody, some reporter, not a newspaper reporter, maybe a radio reporter, asked Murtaugh about the all-black lineup. And I guess Murtaugh's response was, I, I didn't realize we had nine blacks out there. I thought we had nine pirates. Right, but, right. Um, he kind of, the way he answered it kind of made it seem that he knew what was going on. He knew that it was an all-black lineup, but he, he was trying to underplay it. He didn't want right. to... He didn't want to, you know, point himself out as some sort of a civil, a civil rights leader. Right. He, he just wanted to do it in a kind of a quiet way. Uh, I know the time is short, but I want to bring something, if you allow me, up to the attention of uh, our friends. Absolutely. Roberto had premonitions as to his future. In spring training 1972, he told me a few times, firmly, I have to get 3,000 this year. A few weeks before the All-Star game in Atlanta, I saw him, his ankles were swollen, and he again said, I have to get Luisito 3,000 hit this year. Mm. And talking to Vera years after, she says that he told her, I will die in order to go in the Hall of Fame, and he would tell Vera, I will die young. I will die young. He had premonitions. Yeah. I keep Roberto in my mind, and I see him through a corridor of time. And I see him at the end, taking his cap off, waving, and like he's uh, acknowledging an ovation. And that was the title of my only bio on Roberto in 1987. Roberto Clemente still hears the ovations. He, he touched me. He made me a better person. He lived 38 years, four months, and 13 days. 
And I thank God because that was a gift of God, my friendship with Roberto. You know, you think of two of the greatest heroes in baseball history, and they both were taken from us young. Lou Gehrig was right. about the same age, and as you mentioned, Roberto Clemente yes. uh, at the age of 38. Uh, they didn't live long, but they did They did a lot of good in a short amount of time. There's yes, no doubt agree. about that. Yes, Luis, it's been an absolute pleasure. We thank you for your many insights. Uh, you have told us some things that uh, I don't know that too many other people could have told us about. Uh, other than maybe the Clemente family themselves, but it's been great having you with us. Uh, you've always been a great friend to me, to the Hall of Fame. You're always welcome here, and um, we uh, we want to wish you best of luck on that upcoming milestone 75th birthday. Thank you, and I thank you once again. This chat with you in 50 years as an adult in MLB has been, and I mean it, perhaps the most unforgettable moment in in my life. I respect and love you as a person. I respect the Hall of Fame. Well, thank you very much, Luis. We do appreciate it. Uh, you're a terrific man and uh, great help to us here uh, in educating the public about the great one, Roberto Clemente. We do thank you, thank you. Uh, for being with us. Folks, we hope you've enjoyed our special Roberto Clemente Day program with Luis Mayoral, a major league executive, broadcaster, writer, author, general manager and close friend to Roberto Clemente. We hope you've enjoyed the program today coming from Cooperstown, also coming from Luis's home in Texas. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for being with us.